Okay. Looks like we're live. Ladies and gentlemen, hello. Uh, I'm live, I think, in the group. I think it's working. So if someone wants to leave me a comment, say that they can hear me, that it's all coming through okay, that we're all uh, active, then I think we're all good. It says I'm live, which is great. As I mentioned uh, before as well, I'm taking calls, um, answering questions, taking calls on tomorrow's outturn, because the night before outturn, and I'm going to be taking a few questions and calls as we go. Really great to have, have people joining, which is great. Jessica Ross, Samuel Licardi, Lee Wallace, Lachlan Watt, Alex Moores, Nick Huzek, Scott Fitzsimons, John Buffard. Thank you, everyone. Um, we can hear you. Fantastic. Like I said, I'm also um, taking calls if anyone wants to um, jump in and answer, ask any questions. We're talking about the night before outturn. Uh, do you take song requests? <laughs> Coming through Trill, awesome. Yeah, no, I can take some requests. I've got a trumpet here, but I'm not much of a singer. Sorry. Here for the pens. Mm. You actually do need a pen for outturn. It's a good It's a good tip to have, to have a, a good pen handy to mark what you're after. So, and again, I don't have any pens. I never have any pens on this desk. Uh, none at all. It's all digital these days. I don't have any pens. I'm really sorry. But if you do call... Uh, uh, I you're going live, like you're going live with me. So um, you know, keep the profanity down as always. Keep keep it nice and jovial. And I'm happy to take any calls and talk about some of that turn going on tonight. Um, take some of your questions. Facebook's playing up a bit again on me tonight. It was the other night as well. Um, so I've gone. I've scrolled back to the previous version and everything, so it all works, uh, which is great. So um, thank you everyone for tuning in as always. Back in the whiskey office here. Outturn is tomorrow. This is the night before, so I can talk about what's in it, what to grab, t- take some of your questions. Um, and I think we might start with Malt of the Month because it's Malt of the Month. You know what? I reckon Malt of the Month this month is a ripper. 149 bucks for a 68.2% distillery 44th, who those, for those who love the spirit that comes out of the um, Bacardi Empire. That one is in the Deep Rich and Dried Fruits profile. Uh, it's a second fill Oloroso sherry cask. Um, you owe me a shot, Santa. <laughs> I owe you a shot. I don't know what I know you a shot of, but um, I'll, I'll take your word for it. Now, I had to send my bottle. I, I sent my bottle of the 44.116 to uh, Brook and Jules at Whiskey and Ailment um, so that they can pouch them up uh, for some members and whatnot from the bar. So I'm going to have to pour from this sample bottle that I've kept aside so I could do this stream tonight. So I've got here 44.116. I'll hold that one up so you can see it. There we have it. Eight-year-old sherried 44.116. Thanks, Gavin. Good to hear. Yes, I'm using the real mic tonight rather than just the phone microphone or computer mic. It sounds a lot better that way. Here's two people shots. Oh, well, okay. There you go. <laughs> uh, Johnny Edwards, uh, Joey Santon, Oliver Marutis, Seamus Carroll, Robert Akers, Ivan Myers. Good to see you all. A lot of trade in here tonight. I guess we're all have Thursday nights off. Uh, when will we see the SNWS juice boxes? Yeah, good question. That's a question for Whiskey and Almond. Um, they're working on it. They're working on a selection from uh, April outturn to go out to be out available on the website shortly for them. Um, but they're only just they're only doing three bottles, I believe, from the outturn, so not a huge amount. Uh, however, we are working on some plans for how to best uh, make the most of May outturn because. Uh, You've got to understand there's logistics involved with doing this and having them bottled in a food-safe environment. Uh, this office doesn't have food-safe accreditation, so I can't do it here. Uh, <laughs> and um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it is what it is. So I've, I've, got to take, I've got to tread carefully with that. So, but May is going to be... We're going to have the, uh, some May samples available to members as well. As well as, of course, the 20th of April. Still a few available online. Uh, is the gathering pack where you can sit down and enjoy five single cask samples, including a very lovely 33 in there. Uh, I'm going to do that on the 20th of April with everyone. So if anyone, if everyone still wants to grab one of those, 99 free post. Uh, it's on the website now for members. Uh, cool. Glad it's all coming through. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a quick save, Seamus. I'll tell you what. <laughs> so um, yeah, very cool. Very cool. Uh, I'm just going to um, just going to pop. Oh, you can see my numbers at the top there. That's all good. 
Does Whisk and Almond ship to Sid? I think they do, Lewis. I think they do. I think that's actually just recently changed for them. They had a rather um, interesting license at Whisk and Almond. So their license is such that it's, um, well, it used, it's, I think it's changed. But anyway, it meant that they could only previously go. I've got a call coming in. Here we go. Let's grab this call. You're live on air with Matt Bailey. I'm just going to fix up the audio. Here we go. Are you coming through loud and clear? Oh, I can hear you perfectly. Cool. And I think everyone else can hear you as well. That's, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Alex Moores, our Victorian uh, state manager. Welcome. And um, thanks for joining the call. Well, thanks for having me. I thought I'd, uh, I'd kick it off. Um, and uh, speaking of Malt of the Month uh, and a few others in this month's outturn made me think of it. Um, <clears throat> I, I see, you know, like things like Distillery 44 and maybe Distillery 1, they're often uh, not the uh, house style of the distillery. And I'm um, just wondering, with your knowledge of sort of the UK branch and selecting casks, is that a product of uh, sort of a, a selection of casks by Ewan? Um, the type of whiskey that's passing panel happens to be different and it's their sort of flavour preference or is it just what we can get from distilleries? Uh, no, it's it's a mix. It's pretty much, it's it's a good question, a great question. What it is, it, most of the time, it's it's you and wanting to experiment with flavour profiles and discovering what what the output of a distillery can be like when it's, not out, when it's outside of their house style. So that might be seeing something like a distillery 44 in full sherry maturation like this one or it might be a case of seeing something like Distillery 1, as you referenced, um, where it's in completely bourbon maturation. It's outside of the norm, which actually is an interesting way to explore the outside the classical house style of that distillery. So it's a case of sourcing spirit, and a lot of the time what Ewan is sourcing is new make. So he's sourcing new make, and then he's able to uh, select the wood policy for those casks. So if he's able yeah, to source awesome. a... Uh, you know, two thousand liters from Distillery One as a as a just a point of reference as a as a hypothetical, I should say. Then that uh, he might say, well, why don't we put eighty percent of that into Bourbon Oak because it's never like we've never done that before, and it's like it's interesting, and it's and I've got to be honest, like those those examples are ones where I've really loved those spirits because they're so far removed from what you expect, and what you don't want when you open a society bottle is, in my opinion, is basically just a, an amped up version of a core range bottling. You want something unique. You want a flavor profile on a cask type that is unique and is interesting without it just being a, uh, just like, yeah, again, a cask strength version of a core range bottling. Does that make sense? Couldn't agree more. Yeah, couldn't agree more. But also, Great some, answer. Of the, but some of the sourcing might be of mature stocks as well. And they do we do source a lot of mature stocks. And that might be in a case where a distillery has filled into an exotic cask type. That now, a good example of that, if you if you dial back like two or three years, you'll remember all those uh, Chenin Blancs at a distillery 35. There must have been three or four casks, or maybe even more, that we saw locally at the very least, um, where they were ex Shannon Blanc matured. Now they didn't have a plan for any core range of those casks, and so they were sold to the society. It's like, well, there's some interesting casks in there. They still have to pass panel like anything else, but then they're they're outside a core range. There's no, there's, you know, there's a Chardonnay cask, of course, uh, from that distillery, but there wasn't any any plans for any uh, anything outside of like a special release. So, yeah. Very cool. Thanks, yeah. Matt. You're very welcome. You can call back again. Any other questions? I'm going to drop you off there. Alex, anything, unless you've got anything else? No, nope, easy. Good on you. Very cool, mate. Very cool. Thanks for calling. Um, uh, thanks. That was the first call that came through. That's very exciting. Um, yeah, 35.179. That's exactly right. Uh, let me grab some of these comments. Mark Teague in Tassie says, question, Matt Bailey, uh, 59.59, Spox Ewax sold out from March outturn this week. So do you just add a few more bottles for the April outturn tomorrow? <laughs> no, I'm afraid not, Mark. I had a really good question about that from another member, actually. What happened in that scenario is that we saw that there was, like, when we have to arrange how many what bottlings are going in an outturn, we have to sort of work three or four weeks in advance. So Susie and I are already talking this week about and, and Andrew, sorry, Andrew, Susie, and myself are talking about um, like the May outturn selections already because we have to and we have to say, well, we've still got enough of 59 to 59 left, but we don't for tomorrow anymore. Sorry, they were just far more popular than we thought. Uh, and sometimes they, they are, and sometimes we see a bit of a rush on them, but also oh, it works the other way around. Just remember to keep an eye on the website because sometimes bottles get re uploaded that were previously out of stock because it may have been allocated to an event, and then it's like, well, in this case, the events have all been cancelled, so sometimes that stock will just end up back on the website. So good question, Mark. Good question. 
Uh, correct, all L and C. I don't know what that means, Gavin. Sorry. Um, uh, here we go. Um, John says, so it's not a distillery calling up saying we've got something that doesn't fit us. It sometimes might be that, John. It sometimes might be a case of um, of a distillery saying, hey, we've got some interesting casks that don't fit our core range that we're not going to release as a core range bottling because, A, there'd be too few of them. You, I mean, if you're talking about a core range bottling from some of these distilleries, they need hundreds of casks to justify a release, uh, even, even just for, you know, sometimes a few thousand bottles around the world. Whereas in this case, we're looking at single casks. So they might call us up and say, they might call up Ewan and say, hey, we've got a parcel of these six casks that are doing really well. Uh, they're all from X Oloroso or X Chenin Blanc or X Bourbon or whatever they're not their house style is uh, and offer them up to Ewan and he might be interested, he might not, and they might go through panel, they might pass, they might not. Uh... Hot <laughs> Lockie says, hot damn, do I remember those? Yeah, they were incredible, Lockie. That was just such a great era, 35s that came through. 35 as a distillery, Glen Murray Distillery was treated like a sandbox distillery uh, for in, in a way, like a, a, a sand pit or sandbox is a better word for it. Uh, like an experimentation distillery in the, <clears throat> before they were sold off, uh, they were part of Glen Murray Group. <coughs> Got a call coming through. I don't know who it is. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Hello, you're live with Matt Bailey. Who's speaking? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's try that again. Who was that? Sorry. Hello. Hello. Are we on? We on. Who's that? Sorry. Rob Akers. Ah, oh, Rob Akers. How are you, mate? Very well, mate. I was just uh, thinking about this this talk of wood and the strange casks that the uh, the distilleries can't use themselves, and it got me thinking about the society's own wood management program. Is that a, a case of getting special casks from the distilleries and then managing the, the casks themselves? Or is the society getting casks and then uh, filling from distilleries and then managing the, the wood that way? Like what's the, it's what's more, the deal? It's more the latter, uh, especially in the last five years. So it's been more a case of us sourcing uh, wood, not necessarily from distilleries. We're sourcing wood from a number of cooperages and wineries and uh and whatnot, and imports off of bourbon um, producers, uh, so that we can control the wood policy from the start to the finish, kind of thing, rather than just relying is, on is what there, we can get. Is there then a, you know, a, somebody who's out there trying to find really weird, funky casts where they're going to make some of these interesting expressions, like the Shannon Blancs we've seen? Yeah, I uh, will tell you what, I mean, even just like last week, actually, or maybe two weeks ago, um, you and Campbell just got back from Spain. Uh, on a work trip, and he was just, um, he just signed 102 uh, really fantastic sherry casks, like just for maturation. Like it's 102 casks. It sounds like a lot. It won't really be that many, really, when you think about it over time. But it's, it's, um, it's really cool because he's found, he's, they are proper bodega sherry casks that he's, he's secured for future maturation. But they're also working um, at the moment. They've only just announced, but they're, they're um, working on a whole bunch of different musket barrels. Australian red wine casks over in Scotland, which is rather cool. Uh, and all sorts of things like that where, yeah, they are definitely sourcing out interesting and exotic woods. But also at the same time, having that base of great bourbon casks and great sherry casks is, is important. We don't want everything in, you know, you know, toasted musket casks or something because sometimes they, it might not fit the spirit. Uh, it might coat it a bit, might be a bit too much in cask influence. But uh, it's a case of just keeping it, keeping that interesting, and actually sourcing some really interesting wood types coming through. And Ewan's been working quite diligently on that. Our wood management program at the society has completely evolved in the last four or five years, which has been amazing to see. Uh, in our post Glenrangie days, for those who don't know, we were owned entirely by Glenrangie PLC up until 2015, and we've been completely independent since. Um, so that's that's changed, of course, because we've had to develop our own wood policy program, our own wood management program, I should say and develop our own wood policy for maturation and even for finishing or extra maturation as well. Is that including the uh, the recoupering and the ch toasting and the charring and the HTMCs and all of that? Yeah, that's everything, yeah. And the HTMCs is actually pretty new for us in many ways because that was something that Ewan was pioneering. And if I'm being completely honest, keep an eye out for anything you see in second fill HTMC. We had a couple of 53s through last year that was second fill HTMC that I think were actually far better than the first fills, if that makes sense. They were just fantastic. Amazing. Team refill. Yeah, like team, hashtag team refill. Fantastic. Yeah, awesome question, Rob. Thanks very much, Matt. I'll let you get on. Anytime, anytime. Thanks, mate. 
Some great questions coming through both on the phone line and in text. I love this. This is great. I hope, I, I'm assuming you can all hear the, the, other, the other two sides of the phone call there. That's what, that's, that's what this desk is supposed to be doing for me, so I hope that's working. Um, John Laws fan. Yeah, r- right on, Dan. <laughs> I, need to get, I need to get a golden microphone, though, don't I, really? Let's be honest. Uh, following one from uh, Robert's query on additional wood treatment, says Ian, is the society seeking a spe- specific t- style? Ugh. Is the society seeking a specific style? There's four S words there. Or do they see limitations in the cask that might benefit from additional wood? Very good question, Ian. Um, we are there are specific styles, but more spe- more specifically, uh, what the X treatment of that cask is uh, is also really interesting for us, and also the sizes. I mean, the size of the cask plays a huge part of it. The source where that cask comes from is it European oak? Is it American oak? Is it Spanish oak? Uh, is it Japanese oak? Whatever it is, and so that's um, I think, and it's it's sort of like the wood treatment is really up to the the casking team. It's up to Ewan and Kai to work on that. Uh, but no, there's no specific style that we're looking for. Uh, it's it's really just good quality that can then fit into a flavor profile. And uh, even uh, last night I was talking a little bit about um, light and delicate, pardon me, uh, as a flavor profile versus even like heavily peated. There's a variation in, in wood and in spirit and where they meet in the middle is uh, almost unlimited. Actually, I would say actually not almost actually unlimited. Uh, some great questions coming in. Um, James asks, what sort of... Uh, lag time do you think there'll be between the government announcing the gatherings can occur again and events being held James um, good question look we're all sort of everyone's treading on eggshells at the moment no one really knows what's happening next or what the next announcement is or isn't Um, uh, it's as soon as it's okay to have gatherings again there'll be an event up on the website within probably an hour I'm not even kidding that would we will be acting really fast to bring that events part the in person event not just online obviously uh, but the in person events back to the offering of society members as soon as humanly possible and we've got obviously a few venues that we already had events lined up for in the next few weeks that aren't happening anymore and as soon as they a lot of them will stay open of course in terms of some of them are venues rather than bars uh, but as soon as they've got staff again and as soon as we're able to host again we are so I'd say the lag is one hour or less. Um, Mark Teague asks question 15 bottles of 53.309 chestnuts in a peak on, went online in the shop today is there a story behind that Matt Bailey Mark I actually got a bottle of that in my office and I meant to have it in front of me for this stream right now so I could talk about it but I don't at the moment I can grab it in a bit um, that bottling was just one of the 53s that was featured at one of the last events we did so I think that was the Adelaide tasting and I think we had 24 of them maybe 9 sold or something like that um, so that's, there's 15 left. So that was just something we popped on the website. Also helps. There wasn't much peated stock on the website. So we want to make sure that the next, something that we just pop up on the, on the sly is a peated whiskey. Obviously 53s are always a lot of fun. So if you want to grab one of those, you can pop it into your cart for tomorrow. Uh, obviously your cart doesn't secure your bottling. Just there's a good outturn tip right there. It's checkout secures your bottling, not cart. So Mark, I hope that answers your question. Sometimes the, 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 the short version is, Sometimes we just pop things up on the website periodically throughout the month. So it's worth checking here and there um, because, and it might often be something like four bottles of something that uh, was left over. It might be two bottles of something. It might be 15. So it's just a case of where we find something that needs to go up and we put it up. Uh, Rob Akers, uh, not as much play on the live as I expected. Very cool. Timo, good to see you. Hope you're well. Is this Psychic Oz TV? If I give you my star sign, can you tell me when I'll find love and inherit my fortune? Yes, Scott. That's what's happening right now. <laughs> Thanks, George. You already got me. Uh, star sign and credit card number, please. Yeah. <laughs> Do not give me your credit card number. Um, well, we can hear you. I don't know if it's Psychic or Psychic, or it's psychic Oz TV. <laughs> Stuart Mountjoy, good to see you. Nathan Ford, Alex Carter, good to see you all. Uh, by the way, millennials like to text, not call you. Oh, okay. Well, if I've got a text from you, Cal, sorry. Cal asks, speaking of house style, reading the tasting notes on this outturn, we have seen 112 and 113, two big distilleries. Uh, with the tasting notes, it sounds very different and fit the profile of a couple of different distilleries. Would this be the the cash with the cask management and distillery profile? Uh, I believe so, yeah. I mean, they've, they've, just because those numbers are close by doesn't mean they have any similarities at all, but they are, uh, they are obviously... The question is being about how 
Yeah. Um, no, but they're very different distilleries as well, remember, Cal. I mean, one on two is part of a big distillery that's probably one of the most diverse ranges of distilleries in the world. And 113 is one of the highest, ele- equal highest elevation distillery in Scotland, along with Dalwini. Um, I think I'm getting that right. Yes, equal highest. I have to, I have to quote my, have to check my source on that. But yes, um, and my source sometimes. When I say source, it's sometimes Andrew. Um, both love and fortune will be found in a refill hoggy. Ah, yes, team refill. Speaking of team refill, I'm I'm on a second fill, not a refill, and I want to talk about that terminology for a second. If you see, actually, I'm going to grab a, I'm going to grab a refill. It's time for a refill. Lucky we've got a second glass. Okay. Uh, it's time for 55.57, digging up ginger. I've talked about this cask uh, about, uh, I don't know, last week sometime. I'll hold that one up so you can see what it is. 55.57, that's in tomorrow's outturn. Digging up ginger, a 10-year-old refill. Team refill. Here we go. Linus Schlaxman. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Shaxman, sorry. Uh, Linus, uh, I saw the I saw the L in your middle name, sorry, and I carried across. And Talita and Seamus. Is there anyone not from Brown Foreman in the stream right now? Anyway, um, this is uh, this is fantastic to see. Um, that color is what I would call correct. That is that nice light hay color. It's all right tonight. Mm. Very savory, very gingery savory. Andrew and I talked about this on our, our extended chat, which is in on the Facebook group and on our YouTube channel now. Um, digging up refill one, yeah. Digging up ginger, yeah. It's digging up ginger is a is a ripper, ripper cask. I think that's going to be popular tomorrow for good reason. Spicy and dry, spicy and dry profile doesn't get nearly enough love, and it's that really rich. Um, it's a really sort of rich and spicy profile. Uh, I want to do a special th- shout out right now to both Alex Moores and Robert Akers who have both fi- phoned up with great questions. My phone number is in the top of the top of the stream, 0448 If you call, you're going live, so you're live on air with me, and I'd love to I'd love to say hello. Uh, the, so Scott Brickell asks uh, the term second fill, third fill, etc. Is the cask filled and refilled from the same distillery? No, Scott, it isn't. Not always. A lot of the time it is, but a lot of the time it isn't. Um, so uh, it depends on, because that's, that's a really good question that I'm going to have to find out a bit more about, especially on a society side of things, because that's not one that we've talked about too much. But um, in some cases, there's a whiskey coming later this year, which is a uh, refill hogshead that had previously had a society rum in it. So wrap your head around that. So it was a society rum that matured in a second fill and then was used filled with whiskey for its third fill after another char. Um, Alex Moores writes, refill bourbon barrels, the unsung hero of the whiskey world. You know what? That's That statement couldn't be truer. If it wasn't for refill hoggies, refill bourbon barrels and hogsheads, uh, the whiskey industry would not be what you think it is today. And I, I have to stress, I can't stress that enough. They were the backbone of, um, of blended whiskeys uh, for many, many decades. Um, not just decades, many, many, like for centuries, they were the, the backbone of what was, I'm going to go stick with decades. They were the backbone of how whiskey was matured. And often, you know, a lot of the cheap blenders would be using fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth refill casks. Some still do. Um, <laughs> so there's, um, yeah, and they have this, they, they have an, an awesome ability to carry spirit a long way without over, overly encumbering the spirit with oak. But they it, that's not such a bad thing. That means that you get this lovely spirit character without it being new make. You get a spirit character coming through, which is what I get, especially with that digging up ginger. It's almost tropical as well. Like Andrew added a few drops of water to this last week uh, when gatherings were still okay between you know two people or something, whatever it is now. Um, and he said that that sweet characteristic that 55 typically carries came through with a few drops of water. So I've added a bit of water to mine. Zeno says, wrong, Dal, we need to throw second highest distillery. Come on. No, no, no. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm pretty sure what else, what, if you rewind, I think I said Dal Winnie is equal highest elevation. We might be sort of arguing over three or four feet or something like that, but equal highest elevation with distillery 113. Hmm. I'm pretty sure that's right. 
any speculation as to which release for t- from tomorrow's Outtum will sell out first? Mark, you know what? That's a really good question. So let's go back to Outtum, which is what we're here to discuss. Uh, go to the contents, have a look at the bottlings. Oh, who's that on the contents page there? Some some good good looking chap on the on the contents page there. See if you can spot that one. Uh, who have we, I reckon I reckon Malt of the Month will be will be very fast. A high proof sherried uh, uh, Kregeliki is is going to be very popular, especially at one forty nine. That's an absurd price. Can we just all appreciate for the fact that uh, like somewhere near a third of that bottling is tax? That's ridiculous. I mean, that's so good to be able to get. 149 uh, for a single cask sherried whiskey, regardless of the age. That's fantastic. Uh, what else do I think will be really popular tomorrow? I think the 55.57 will be as well. I think Big Swell will be popular, but I don't think it'll sell out immediately because there's 100 and something of them to go around. Uh, but those are, my, those are my tips. I think, however, I think what might be overlooked and should be, uh, should be considered is 137.6, which I've talked about on the stream before. I don't have the bottle here anymore. Uh, 137.6, the Garden Shed of England, a Peter whiskey from England. I don't think it'll be that popular, but I think should uh, does warrant a another a, a closer look because it is quite possibly one of the best Peter whiskies I've had in a long time. I've said that a few times recently about Peter whiskies that weren't from Scotland, aren't from Scotland. Uh, they've got a a different sort of profile. They're sort of cleaner richer, sometimes smokier kind of experiences there. And that's really exciting in a Peter Whiskey for me. Uh, let me grab some of these comments coming in. Um, Craig and Lucky. <laughs> Craig and Lucky. <laughs> uh, Lucky asks, for those in the back, uh, in the nosebleed section, could you please talk about the changes being made on the new livery regarding transparency to cask management and finishing? Yes, great question, Lockie. Great question. I'm going to answer that one now. Okay, so um, let's get to that question, and I'll keep going through the others after that. For those who have been playing along, uh, we've had a full rebrand. So we now use the monogram instead of the old logo, um, and we have we. Uh, it's an uh, it's a new look to a new visual identity for us, encapsulating everything that the society is, and our dedication to being a whiskey club which is what we always have been and what we always will be. So the the visual identity change also is coming to the bottle soon. And our next shipment, which is a month or so or two two months away, whenever that is, Andrew looks after all that, uh, that there's going to be some changes to the front labels, which are, which are a, new, a new identity for the society. It's just a slight refresh. The bottle shape's staying the same. Everything else is staying the same. The flavor profiles will be even more evident. Um, however... Uh, what you're going to start seeing in the, the info box at the bottom here. Right now it says distilled date, cask type, region, space side in this case. You're going to see that that sort of block of data is a little bit more transparent than last time again, than this time again. So if we are doing an extra maturation, so if we do a whiskey that's 11 years in ex-bourbon and then three or four years in ex-sherry, for an example, you're going to see first cask and final cask. Now, we at the Society were being made uh, almost an example of this from the SWA. They said, well, if you're doing finishing, if you're doing extra maturation and you're talking about it, you need to list it on the label. You need to be more transparent, if you're, especially if you're using the words single cask whiskey. Uh, now, we will be the first to, we've been the first in the industry to change. Uh, the, it's the, all the other distilleries like uh, the regularly release, even the core range from single casks, which is the likes of even like McAllen and Glendronach and all sorts. Um, you're going to see they have to. They have to do that as well. They'll have to list the first and final cask. And I think for some distilleries where they've that cask has been zombified across 15 different casks or vatted into one cask, that won't be acceptable anymore. So it'll need to be just then a single malt at that point. And I think that's a really good question. Great question, Lockie. But that's basically what that means is we are going to be more transparent, more transparent on the finishing if there is a finish. Uh, uh, or the extra maturation, I should say. Uh, and, you know, the, the reason here, like first and final, and the proof and the flavor profile and everything. So it's just even a more, bit more detail on the label again. Uh, and, of course, then you'll better find out some the further detail, like the full tasting note and other stuff on the website for each release. Um, 
Robert Akers asks, what's the society rule when, when the bottling is a finish? It, uh, is it single cask or single cask? 115.1.6 cask first fill hoggy XPX. Yes. Uh, I don't know that exact cask off the top of my head, uh, 115.6, but yes, um, it's always one to one. We never do sort of two into one or four into one or 1500 into one. It's a single cask that was maturing that is then finished in a single cask. That is by definition a single cask whiskey still. I don't really think if you get these, all these, uh, some distillers get all these zombie casks, I call them zombie casks, but, you know, bits and bobs from all over the place, put them all into one sherry uh, butt, and then uh, for one day, one week, whatever, marry it together and call that a single cask whiskey, I think is a bit disingenuous. Um, I know of some, ca- some instances of that happening. Um, so, yeah. I hope that answers your question, Rob. It's always one-to-one, and that's what it should be. And we don't, yeah, it's it's always single cask, uh, unless it's things like Big Swirl or other heresy, rele- heresy releases. Heresy. Um, not all that popular if your last name is Duckett. <laughs> okay. <laughs> A famous last words. Beachcomber too. Yeah, Beachcomber's coming, guys. Um, the Beachcomber is the next heresy. We had Battle Axe, now we've got Big Swirl tomorrow, and then Beachcomber is only, I think, two weeks after that or something like that. It's most likely going to be our mid-month offer for... Uh, April. So keep an eye out for that. Um, very attractively priced as well. 120, 120 bucks for those bottlings. They're all 50% ABV. Nice, nice punch to it. Uh, yes, Matt, that is ridiculous. The taxes on alcohol here are so high. They are high. They are high, James. Um, they're, they're, yeah, they are high. They're not, they're, they could be lower. Uh, some countries are up there with us in terms of taxes. Certain areas of, um, Certain states in in the US are um, Sweden is. Um, I don't think Canada's tax is is very um, friendly either. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I know we're, you know we're one of a few countries that get pretty stung on excise. Um, uh, uh, um, Dalwini at eleven sixty four feet above sea level. Okay, yeah, I don't. So what's the sea level of Bravel Distillery then? Uh, 115.6 is Cludy dumpling in a sauna. Ah, okay, yes, okay. Sorry, I couldn't remember which exact cask that was. Uh, Rob, thank you. Yeah, so that's an example of one to one. If that's a, that one, that one had a finish, I believe, um, and that was a one to one, and that's what's most important. It's still single cask. Ah, Liam Smee joined. James Villa Janus joined. James, happy birthday again, mate. The big six zero. What a legend. Doesn't never mind the fact that you don't look a day over forty, but um, you know, good on you. Cheers. I did, I did add a small drop of water to that one. Digging up ginger. What a cask. That's lovely. It's grassy and gingery and spicy. Definitely in spicy and dry. Very dry. But it's got that um, lovely, just just that top tropical note right at the end. And that's, I love it. It's just, it's got complexity going on in there. Can't see government reducing taxes after COVID-19. Ian, I can't either. <laughs> I think the alcohol industry is keeping their taxation going at the moment. The amount, the lines you see coming out of bottle shops at the moment for um for their slabs of beer uh, is is astronomical because everyone's worried that bottle shops might be next to close. Uh, I I don't know what's going to happen. No one. I'm not going to speculate on what could happen. All I'm going to say is that I know what I know, which is the society is still running. Uh, the only thing that's not running for us is our partner bars. Unfortunately, love you guys to bits, and I hope to see all the partner bars back uh, on deck soon. And of course. Uh, our events, our online events. So, uh, sorry, our in-person events. That's the only other thing we're not doing at the moment. But everything else is still as go. We're still doing lots of online events, streams like this, talking about Outturn. And of course, 20th of April, we're doing the Gathering Pack. It's 99 with free shipping on the site. There's only a few left, actually. I think we sold about 90 of them or something. They're really, they're, they're popular because they're going to be a really good way for you to interact, have a tasting in home at your home because you're meant to be at home. Stay home. Um, Lee asks, have you tried the G4.19? Lee, I haven't. Um, the only reason I haven't is because uh, I've tried most of Outturn now, but I've not tried the G4.19 because... Uh, where is it? Ah, because we've got 12 bottles in the country uh, and I didn't want to open one, which meant that uh, that would mean only 11 members can access it. Uh it's a first fill lowland grain whiskey 
first fill PX hogshead. So that is an additional maturation. If it was 40 years in sherry, that's absurd. So it spent 37 years in bourbon and then transferred to a first fill Pedro Jimenez hogshead aged of 40 years. I would have loved to have tasted it. I'm not going to get the chance, but um, I do love old grain. I've, I've talked about old grain before and how it is an underrated complexity to old grain, especially sherried grain. I know that the color on it's quite ruby, quite lovely, and it's going to be a lovely, rich, old sherried whiskey. And let's be honest, unbelievably good value. And I know I've said that about two bottlings already tonight, but to get a 40-year-old whiskey for five ninety nine dollars uh, is absurd especially single cask, cask strength, panel approved, 40-year-old whiskey. And everyone writes it off, people often write off grain. They're like, oh, grain is not as complex, not as interesting as as, as malt whiskey. I, I, I discount that wholesale. That's not really a thing. Yes, it's different. It's different. It's like saying, it's like if you hear someone saying that bourbons are less complex or less interesting than malt whiskeys. No, well, that's subjective. That's that's people who have a difference of, of palate, difference of opinion. Uh and um, don't tell Andrew I said that. Uh, how do I get the pack? The pack, Julia Megan, the pack is on a society website, on the homepage and on the shop page, smws.com.au. Grab the packs, 99 free shipping. Um, when will HS1.2 be available? James, I, I really hope you didn't uh, bite too hard into that April Fool's joke. <laughs> 112.50 looks rather nice. Shame it's only 12 as well. It's actually 11 because um, I, I, I sent one to... Uh, to, to Lachlan, uh, Lachlan Watt from Whiskey and Helmet, who's um, going to be enjoying all that as well. Uh, but I love the 112s. That, 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 that sort of tobacco-y kind of rich notes that you get out of them are ob- ob- obscenely fun and interesting yeast profiles in them as well. Gerald says, hi, Matt. Hey, hey, mate. Uh, thank you so much for doing this for the outturn as well as saying, as well as doing it day in, day out during this times of lockdown. Before I get to your question, Gerald, just on that point, I do this every single day, whether it be on Instagram or on Facebook, and it's not just during lockdown. I've been doing it every day for a year. So I love these kind of things, and I love being able to interact with you guys online. So always happy to be here. The only thing that's changed during lockdown is that I've somewhat upgraded the equipment so that I can you can hear me a bit better rather than me shouting at a phone. Um, the camera's still not great, but I'm working on that. But it's, as long as you can hear me, you know. Uh, so his question is, my questions are, A, is it, is it true the whiskies that come out of 113 Distillery are not consistent and great, which is why it's not a as popular valued as, say, Brewer or Port Island, for example? That's, I mean, that's, a, that's not really a... That comparison is kind of a bit of a funny one, but I'll, I'll keep going. Um, B, what is your personal opinion of whiskey coming from them? And, and lastly, C, uh, how does SMWS go about picking casks from these type of distilleries? Thanks, champ. So you're talking about Distillery 113. You're talking about Bravel Distillery, or did you mean 112? Um, either way, I'll, I'll grab that um, I'll grab that comment. So big question there from Gerald. Three-part question. A, uh, is it true that um, whiskies that come out of 113 Distillery are not as are not consistent? I wouldn't agree with that. In fact, it's actually the complete opposite. It, most of the output from Distillery 113 is built for blenders. What do blenders look for? Consistency. They want consistency in output from from the distillery so that they can blend with consistency so that every blend tastes the same. Uh, if I buy a bottle of Shivers 12 this year versus Shivers 12 next year, they want to make sure that it pretty much tastes the same. It doesn't always, but they're very, very, very good at blending. So consistency is not their problem. Um, I'd say that they're just interesting. They're often light. That's the one thing I'll say about 113s, if, we're talk- if that's the one you meant. 113.24, Attack of the Killer Florists in Outturn tomorrow. 155 bucks, a first fill seven year old, lovely whiskey, definitely in the young and sprightly, very sprightly, very uh, visceral, and um, very floral, very floral. Um, but what I'll say is that it's interesting tasting a single cask from a distillery that not only do you not see any core range from, but you just don't see any even many independent bottlings of. When was the last time you had an independent cast strength first fill Bravel? I don't know when it was for me, but a while ago. Um, so I wouldn't say they're not consistent, and I'd say they're great whiskies. They just, they, I just find that with one one threes, they're often quite light, uh, quite floral, uh, almost a bit lowlandish in a way. But that's I think to do with their altitude and their, and their spirit is quite, um, is quite, uh, quite light and brisk. Uh, the second part of your question said, um, 
Uh, well, I mean, I wouldn't. I, I don't think comparing it to say Brewer or Pat Port Ellen is fair because they're they're very very different. I mean, we're talking Brewer was you know the the across the road the peated you know, peated clean leash if for lack of a uh, going into too much detail on that. But and Port and Port Ellen, of course, uh, the morting floors still work at Port Ellen, but the distillery do, uh, is being rebuilt at the moment because every everything old is new again. Um, but yeah, I, I, they they sort of have mythical status. Any peated distillery, any peated whiskey distillery that closed in the last <laughs> uh, last 50 years uh, ha- in Scotland has a sort of, uh, you know, real mythical status about their output, and I think often wrongly so. Let me put it this way. If it was a terrible distillery then, no, that's not fair. If it was, if the output isn't always fantastic, and it wasn't always fantastic at, at Port Ellen, for instance, I've had some shocking Port Ellens. I've had some great ones as well. Um, but really, I mean... You, it's it's kind of like it's got this mythical status because it's closed, not because it was great. Uh, I think if a, a distillery like uh, Bravel were to close next week, I think it might uh, it'd probably get a bit more of a mythical status about it as well, uh, because people are like oh, I don't remember the old you know the old Bravels of old times roast into glasses as I've said before, and I think that's a bit unfair. I think it's say you can say, well you know just I'm I'm much more of an optimist about what's to come rather than what was, so. Um, I hope that's a bit of a bit of a roundabout answer, uh, and I hope that answers part B. But uh, number C, uh, number C, number C, letter C. How does the SMWS go about picking casks from these type of distilleries? From distilleries like One One Three, I mean, it's it'd be a relationship with Pernod Ricard most likely that we source the wood, we source the spirit from, source the casks from, and go from there. I hope that helps, Gerald. I'm, I'm going to move on to some other questions, but keep them coming. My number's also up there. If anyone wants to do a phone question, you go live if you call though. It's all hooked in here. Uh, and, uh, drinking a 25-year-old Invergordon currently. Yeah, Lockie, good man. Old grain, great stuff. Uh, Scott Brickhill asks, when the society uses their own cask, do they take it to the distillery for filling or does the distillery send the new make to the SMWS warehouse for them to fill? Scott, you've answered some absolute pearlers. You know what? I'm going to give you, Scott, you've just won a sample. I told you I had some giveaways tonight. I'm going to send you a sample of 55.57. Digging up ginger. That's yours. Done. Uh, I'm, I'll have to watch this back to remind myself. Okay. Um. <laughs> I'm going to skip your question, Ross, because that's not a question, but I appreciate it. Stubble suits me. No, I haven't had a shave. There you go. Um. <laughs> but anyway, Scott Brickell, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to tell you that question on notice. I don't know exactly the logistics of how that new make gets into that cask, but it's a very good question and one I have to ask the casking team. I'm not going to try and make that up. Uh, hi, Matt. Are all the whiskeys you buy a tax deduction? <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, most of them are, I mean, to a certain extent. Um, and all of us, did you guys decide on bringing any US distilleries in as per Andrew's question the other week? Yes, yes, and yes, yes. And quite a few. So... Uh, there's some great American whiskies, as Andrew said, bourbons, rice, and single malts being bottled as society single casks uh, that are coming into Australia later this year. Um, well, they won't be too far off, um, but they are getting bottled at the moment. So bottling, labelling, blah, 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 is all happening. It's in, it's in mid-production at the moment. Andrew looks after all the allocations, the selections, all the notes and everything for that. So he has gone ahead and ordered those. I can tell you that much, but all the rest would have to go to him. Owen oh, Phillips, good to see you, mate. Um, cheap upgrade for your camera. <laughs> yeah, I, I look. It's it's not really a camera. It's but anyway, yeah. Well, it is obviously. But um, uh, had a Zoom birthday party. What did I miss? Tim, you haven't missed too much. We're just talking about outturn. Uh, tomorrow's outturn is the night before outturn. I'm here taking questions. Bravel, sorry. And yes, I, I should have said, especially during these times. I knew we were doing this every day. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Appreciate it, Gerald. Always appreciate it. Mostly on Instagram, but the biggest streams like these, like the night before outturn and maybe the night before mid-month release and stuff like that, we'll probably go to Facebook group because it's uh, it's a wider audience of mostly members. So I, um, of course, you know, I don't worry too much about the medium. It's all about the message. Um, rest of me thankful, Bravel. I don't remember that one, Dave, but yeah, there's, that's what I mean. There's not, there's not too many, you don't see too many indie Bravels. You don't see too much out of that distillery in, outside of it being blended. Um... Lots of garden themed names going on. Uh, Rob says two garden sheds, killer forest, digging up ginger. Yeah, that's it. Well, yeah, we actually a bit of an accidental theme going on there. Um, 
Thank you for touching on that mythical status. There's what I was hoping to, on asking as well. Yeah, well, that's that's what I meant. I, I could dig into that a bit more. I really do. I really do believe that. I really do believe that we sometimes give certain closed distilleries um, uh, this absolute sort of mythical unicorn status for no reason whatsoever. And sometimes, yes. Look, I'll be honest. I've had some. Well, I've had better brewers than I've had Port Ellens, but uh, I've had a number of Port Ellens where I've gone. That's good, but it's not great. Okay. I'm going to take a question. Here we go. One second. Uh, let's see. That audio is working fine. Hello, you're live. You speaking. Had a, it's Sean. Sean. <laughs> like, are you seriously giving out a phone number to call people on? Yeah, well, you're live. You're live on air right now. All right. Okay. I was. I was. I just had a thought. I was looking at my collection. And I saw the uh, the 15th anniversary bottle of study, and I was wondering, like, what would you want to see for the 20th anniversary? Like, it's you know. A couple uh, of years away, but... Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> so you saw the 15th one. Yeah, the the 73.83. Is that the one you saw? Yeah, yeah. I got a couple of bottles sitting on my shelf. Yep. Another one. Very very nice whiskey. Uh, it was a refill sherry whiskey from Distillery 73. So um, it's funny, actually, you asked that. And that's something that Andrew, as Cellar Master, has already been working on for the 20th anniversary. And um, mm. uh, we, we've already had samples submitted as well for us to go off as well. So there's already a few casks submitted that, and um, yes, predictably we are looking at a 20 year old whiskey for that one. Uh, if, if, if you had to like, forget the samples, like if you had like, this is what I'd like to see in a 20 year old whiskey or what, what would the, what would it be? You mean in terms of profile or distillery or? Yeah, profile, distillery, what, what would you be looking for? Uh, I mean, if it was me, what I'd be looking for, would be something along the lines, personally, if it was my choice entirely, I'd be looking for something like uh, a code, first of all, that we don't see too many of. That's because it, it's, it's mm. often, it means it might be something a little bit sort of obscure off the wall a bit. And as, again, like I mentioned earlier on in the stream, from a cask type that that distillery doesn't usually um, uh, distill into. So that might be something mm. like a 20-year-old sherry Glenord or something like that, or a 20-year-old sherry Talibadine or... Or a twenty-year-old Balchin, Balchin, yeah, or something like that. I mean, it's something interesting, which is uh, outside of the realm of what we'd normally see in that realm. But yeah, I mean, I think I just want something fruity, something fun, something that mm. uh, that is. I mean, if I'm being honest, the fifteen-year-old, the, the fifteen-year-old for the fifteen-year anniversary was accessible mm. and fun, and it wasn't. It wasn't the kind of whiskey where it requires you. That know, was great. To, yeah, but it doesn't need massive dissection. That, if you know what I mean, it, nah. it, it was a fun whiskey, and I think you'd, we want something sort of similar for the twentieth. It'd be something that is yeah. accessible to lots of people that a lot of members can really get around and enjoy, it, rather than it being sort of like uh, you know one exclusively for um, for the tuliped glasses at, at two pm. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> cool. Well, best of luck for the rest of the stream. I'll catch you around. Thank you so much for the question, Sean. Really appreciate it, and. That was another question. That was a question from Sean. Really appreciate it. He's, uh, it's great getting that calls through, and I hope you can all hear that, and it's all coming through nice and clear. Um, uh, yeah, well, okay. So, yeah, 2021, we'll see a lot of dot ones. Yeah, maybe. I mean, the, we're working with a lot of new distilleries, but it, it's it's when it's ready, not when it's reached a certain age. So it will happen when it happens. Van asks, hey, you got any info on anyone working on Scotch Asian tequila uh, bottles, Matt. Um, I'm assuming you mean Scotch aged in Scotch being aged in tequila barrels. Um, I know that we are. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, distilleries now. Some of them are playing around with that. I, I know of two distilleries that are playing around with it, and one of them is Loch Lomond, and they've put some spirit into ex tequila casks already. And I know that um, I'm pretty sure that uh, Glen Murray have as well. But they were they were talking about it. I don't know if they've actually done it. Because they have a change in master distiller, so it's you know, it, uh, so that's that's a very short answer, but I hope that hope that works. James Sutton asks, "What are the postage rates for Express Post, uh, so as to hopefully receive them before the Easter long weekend?" Good question. I think Express Post is twenty instead of fifteen, uh, but I need to check in with Susie on that one. Um, yeah, that's a question for Susie. I'm sorry. Uh, Zeno asks, does Andrew Derbidge write all the tasting notes, the panel, since we are seeing a lot of dot one? Well, he'll write a, he does write some uh, tasting notes with, uh, uh, sometimes with myself, sometimes panel. It, it's, 
we don't really do the panel so much as it traditionally was years ago. It's completely changed. But it's if we are able to get, um, especially for Austra- like Australian exclusives, we were at the tasting notes. Whiskey and Almond exclusive, they were at the tasting notes, things like that. But um, in most instances, no. I mean, the Dot Ones, um, no. we'll, we'll trust the UK panel. They're experts at it. Farm Salad, oh, there we go. Anzac Bottle, uh, Anzac Bookies, yes. Um, good question from Zeno here. What does the SMWS team uh, day look like tomorrow afternoon in yours? An AD is coming up since May and a couple of other big things coming up in the works. Uh, do you mean like what does it look like day to day at the SMWS office? I mean, we're all working in separate offices at the moment because of uh, virus stuff and uh, isolation and whatnot, but we are communicating like endlessly each day at the moment and long calls and message chats and stuff like that so we can stay in touch. Um, we use email, we use Slack, we use all that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, <laughs> Dave Phillips asks for a St. Magdalene, please, for the anniversary. Yes, Dave, I'm sure we've just got a few 20-year-old St. Magdalene's uh, kicking around. Never mind that that's uh, an impossibility of it being a 20-year-old St. Maggie now. But, um, yeah, we'll bottle a St. Maggie and we'll make it 150 bucks. <laughs> uh, Tura or Tokentosh. <laughs> yeah, the, the joke behind that, so I can run there, there was a joke that uh, Dr. Bill Lumsden from Glamourangie Ardbeg um once made, which I thought was very funny. He said that he, he doesn't like any distillery that starts with T. And uh, and he said, you're like Tormor and Talabadine and stuff. And I, it was just a joke, of course. But, uh, and that's why he said, in, and that's why in Scotland they call it Tura. <laughs> uh, you know, I guess it was it had to be there. But anyway, 20 year old Old Poltney or Scarpa. Yeah, yeah, some, maybe something coastal. It might be something oily and coastal. It might, it don't, we don't know the flavor profile yet. We're working on a few samples. Uh, or makers ask, is there any cask that nobody is trying to put whiskey in at the moment? Nobody's trying to. Whoa. Uh, I mean, thankfully, I I, I think the fishy casks, the um, the ma- the the mackerel casks, the f- ex fish casks that aren't being used anymore. The fishy, I think, came to an end. Thankfully, that was some of the worst whiskey I've ever tasted. Eucalyptus wood, yeah, yeah that doesn't produce good results. Um, it's very hard to get re- great results out of anything apart from oak. Uh, and you do see some sometimes like um, red gum and uh, uh, ash. I've seen ash being used. I don't know if they produce desirable results or not. Um, I did taste a red gum cast matured whiskey that I didn't think was that great. I thought it was like, well, nice little gimmick. I don't know if I could taste any red gum or difference in oak really other than it was it was actually a little bit too oaky anyway. Um, Mark Teague asks... Uh, which distillery numbers consistently release the best youngest SMWS bottlings in your opinion? Ooh, that's a really cool question. Um, I have a belief that every distillery has a sweet spot in age. And uh, in that I, I strongly believe things like um, distilleries like Springbank, for, for instance, excel at older ages. But distilleries like Kilhoman excel at younger ages. So, you know, this, and I think... So that's what there are obviously distilleries that uh, work better at a younger age, and I and if I'm being completely honest, I think that things like 29s for us, uh, I we get a we do get a bunch of old 29s through, but the younger ones I think are just explosively good. Uh, ooh, best youngest. Um, it's a really good question. I mean. If you look at things like 68.18, the, the whiskey and almond cask from a couple of years ago, that was a seven-year-old cask, and that performed amazingly at that age. Uh, that's, a, that's a good one. I mean, it's, you sort of you find different distilleries work, like I said, different ages, but even things like, um, I mean, I like the I like my peated whiskies on the younger side, generally speaking, per, like personally. Some people love older peated whiskies. Uh, if we could all drink, you know, ancient. Bottles of uh, 29 and 33 every every week. That'd be great, but that's not how it works. Um, oh. Hmm. Uh, oh, no. Oh, that's a really hard one. That's a really hard one. I find that it's, it, it, it's, it's very dependent because oh, um, we're talking about single casks and they're always going to be different. So it's like the... Uh, some react differently at different ages and that's... I mean, I've had some... like. I love I love versatility though in a distillery. I'd say a distillery like sixty four. We've had some young casks of sixty four, like some nine and ten year old casks. We had a, a, a quite a slew of older ones. We had a whole bunch of 26, 29, 31 year old casks from distillery sixty four. 
and they were just both fantastic at, age, at different ages. So, yeah, that's a hard one. It'd be a 38-year-old at minimum, wouldn't it, Dave? Yeah, exactly. Um, when's, the, when's the next old spring make? Yeah, yeah, how long's a piece of string? Um, I'm going to grab some of these next questions. I want a three-year-old, 29. Oh, Andrew, don't, I do too. You know what? We had a we had an eight-year-old uh, from Distillery 29 last year at some point that was just fantastic. And it was in the lightly peated category. Uh and it was just, it may have, been, it may have been a nine-year-old, sorry, it was a nine-year-old from, and it was just like fantastic. Like it was just so, so much fun, so much character at that age. I love old 29s, but I think they excel at a younger age. I really do. And I think the distillery know that as well, which is why most of their spirit, I was reading somewhere that like uh, 75 or 80% of the core range has no sta- no age statement at all anymore uh, from, from the Freud distillery, which is a good excuse to use most of the younger stock. Um, yes, there might be some older stock blended in, but there's no point in them doing that if they're going to try and build it to a price point in market. Um, sevens and tens are good at eight years old. Yeah, oh, that's very true. We had a we had a seven dot something seven dot code escapes me uh, about a year ago, which was an eight year old from a first fill sherry that was uh, unbelievable. Little sneak peek for you all, actually, because I'm in the mood for it. You're going to see a quite a young seven dot something coming through for a special release soon. There you go. That doesn't tell you anything. No, it's a festival release, and um, it's a spirit, spirit of space side festival release that we're working on. We're going to get it out. Uh, we'll get it online, of course, uh, but we might even do some sample packs. I'm working on that as well. Uh, match made in heaven. It's great. Yes, Andrew, that was the cask. It was a match made in heaven. Well done. I couldn't remember the code on it, of course. I, Oh, there's so many numbers, but 29 dot something, and it was a nine-year-old, match made in heaven, lightly peated, great whiskey, great fun. Uh, <laughs> everyone's taking a sarcastic question seriously. Bob, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Matt, you have your favorite distilleries, and everyone does, but which distillery are you really looking forward to in the future? Awesome question, Tim. I've actually got a really good answer for you on that. There's, there's a... Um, there's a really, uh, I've been looking forward to um, a few, I've tasted a few young spirits coming out of Scotland, coming out of America, coming out of Australia and whatnot, that I've been really excited for their future of what they, of where I think they're going to be in a few years' time based on how how much quality they're showing in their younger spirit now. One example of that is Wolfburn. Huge fan of Wolfburn. I think what Wolfburn are doing in terms of um, quality of spirit uh at the moment, it has improved radically. So the first release, the very first release of Wolfburn, wasn't very good, even by their own admission. It was it was a bit hot. The spirit was unbalanced. It didn't have the right cast profile, whereas they've really picked up their act and it became something a bit different. And now subsequently, yes, they're still three, four-year-old spirits. Uh, they are young. They are quite volatile, but they're much more balanced now. And I think Wolfburn's one to keep an eye out for. I'm really excited for Ballandalic as well. I haven't tasted anything from there yet, but it's a beautiful distillery. And I'm also excited for um, Lindor's Abbey is really exciting as well. What's happening there? Um, uh, the new, uh, the, the Leith Distillery, which is only just down the road from the Society, so the, from the vaults. Um, so there's a new distillery in Leith, uh, a port of Leith Distillery, I think they're calling it. Or I have to check that. Uh, and uh, yeah, so there's, there's a whole bunch of younger spirits that have tasted out of Scotland recently. Uh, Eden Mill, of course, Eden Mill. Well, they've got a core range now that is actually quite approachable. Isn't doesn't have much um, in terms of like there's nothing really to write home about, but it's a very clean, well put together spirit. And of course, I'm also excited for Ardenho over in um, Isla. But again, I've only tasted New Make, but it was a very lovely New Make. Even if my nose was completely stuffed the day I tried to taste it, but it tasted pretty good. Um, anything out of borders yet? No, I don't think I've, I haven't tasted anything out of borders yet. I don't know if they've released anything. I don't really, it's very hard to keep up with every new distillery, of course, because there's not just the local distilleries in Australia you're trying to keep up with, but also Asian distilleries, American distilleries are are impossible to keep up with. There's thousands of distilleries in in America now. And, uh, in, I like to keep in touch with what's going on in mostly Scotland, a little bit of Ireland. Uh, I'm actually looking forward to tasting some Waterford out of Ireland. Uh, I've not tasted any Waterford yet. I know they've got one release out, which I think is a, two or three year old uh, whiskey, uh, which is sort of like a work in progress, sort of our, you know, uh, our journey or something kind of whiskey. Um, anyway, uh, I'm being reminded of a text actually by one of our members 
Uh, I believe it's time for your other dram. What's the next one? Okay. I'm going to use the same glass. I've got a bit of water here. Not the same glass as Mortal Month, though. That's quite a bruiser. I'm going to let that sit for a bit. Give this a bit of a rinse. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Port of Leith. So are they actually calling the distillery Port of Leith, Mads? That would be really cool. Um, okay. Has anyone got a 78 for our picture hunt? <laughs> I do, I'm enjoying that picture hunt thread. It's a lot of fun. Lots of, lots of, um, lots of whiskeys popping up in there. That's great. Wolfburn represent absolutely lucky. Like, top stuff there. Um, Caleb asks, uh, what are your thoughts on, I don't know. I'm super excited. Worm tubs, a fruity, heavily peated new make. Yeah, I tasted the new make, um, Caleb. As I said, I was, uh, my nose was completely stuffed the day I was tasting it. Um, but uh, I thought it showed a lot of promise. It was it was quite uh, syrupy, the new make. It was quite thick, quite viscous. It's like, you can tell a lot from new make. And you can tell, like, it gives you a, a, an insight into the distillery character, of course, and gives you an insight into their future. And if you're tasting a new make, for me, that tastes flinty, uh, or even sometimes chalky, or dirty, sometimes that's not good. Especially if it's flinty. That's, I find that it's a problem. I don't know what the chemical compound is for that, what's causing that, but it's not good. However, if you're tasting one that is um, has got a bit of, not just a certain, I mean, a bit of sweetness is nice in the new make, but one that's just got a bit of balance. And it's, I often find some new makes I taste, they are, they're hot, they taste, they burn your face off, whereas some are, they've got a, a, a supremely lovely syrupy balance to them. So, uh, so there we go. Uh, Lee Atwood joined. Good to see you, Lee. Um, Clydeside New Make is a is a weapon. I need to try that. Uh, does Leith Distillery release the Krabby whiskey? Uh, I don't think that's I don't think it's the same as Krabby's, or if it is, yeah, yes, on the Waterford front, absolutely, yeah. I'm looking forward to Waterford only because of who's behind it and their approach to what they're doing. Um, it's the two the two cool things about it is it's um, it's name escapes me. Um, Mark. Uh, Ah, you know what? That's going to really bother me. Can someone tell me who it was? Jim McEwen and so and so who started re- reinvigorated Brooklady, and now Mark has gone on to create Waterford. Can someone tell me his name? That'd be great. Um, reason why I'm excited because yeah, great things over Brooklady that happened in 2001 onwards. Um, so that was great, and and then there was um, and their approach. They've taken an old Guinness malting factory, I think it is, where they're building the distillery, and it's. He, it's massive. It's massive. Like seeing a new distillery of that size is truly encouraging. Uh, Mark Rainier, sorry, yes, thank you very much. Surname was 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 escaping me. Mark Rainier, who was uh, who uh, had quite a, a stint of fame in the reinvigoration of Brook Laddie in two thousand and one, uh, along with Jim McEwen. So that was um, that was an amazing era for the Brook Laddie, and I think it'll be an amazing era for Waterford as well. And I'm looking forward to what they produce. Uh, if it's if it's uh, if if it's a quality spirit and we can actually uh, get some, um, okay. Next ram, I've been egged along here. I've tried malt of the month. I've tried uh, digging up ginger. Now I know I've tasted this one before, but I don't I don't have the full out to here. But I'm going to taste this one again. Sound test. There we go. Uh, this one's growing on me. This one's honestly growing on me. So this is ninety three dot one two zero, cocoa and coal. A Campbelltown whiskey. Woo! 14 year old single cast Campbelltown whiskey. No, it doesn't start with S, but it does start with Glen and ends in Scotia. And it's a sweet, fruity, and mellow. Lovely color on it. So it's almost quite a little bit amberish on it. But it's 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 not stereotypically Campbelltown on the nose. It's still got a bit of that funkiness. It's still got a bit of that like hay bales and uh, and diesel fume, just a tiny, tiny bit. But not your usual sort of like big funky sort of Jambleton Lock style uh, whiskey. It's much more a um, unmistakably thick on the palate. Oh, that's fantastic. But it's it's almost got that Lock Lomondy kind of funkiness rather than Campbelltown funkiness, which I like. I love in a whiskey though. It's um, Andrew was talking about this as well. We had us every time we've had a stint of teenage. Um, Campbelltown whiskeys, they are always just fantastic. And if you like that Campbelltown style of whiskey, 
and I don't normally like to talk regionality, but it does have their they do have their own sort of almost their own style of, and they're quite, it's always quite a savory uh, diesel fume farmyard coal docks kind of note to some of them, and I like that in a whiskey. I love that in a whiskey. Um, hot sand. I don't get any hot sand on this one, Lucky. No, I know, and I know exactly what you mean by that comment. I hope you can't hear me swishing it around too much. That's one thing I don't like about whiskey reviewers. You're always hearing, hearing that in the microphone. Eh. Prize or sample. You know what? Yeah. What have I got here? Who wins one? Who wins that one? Uh, well, actually, I've had some... I had a great question from... Actually, Gerald. Gerald, you... I don't know if you're still tuned in, Gerald, but you've just won a sample because you asked an excellent three-part three part question. Gerald, I'm sending you... 93 to 120, the one I'm drinking right now. Cocoa and coal. That's Scott and Gerald. Done. Um, what else have we got here? Uh, they haven't done any releases yet. Only distillery edition for their launch so far. Yeah, I don't think you can get their... Um, I don't think you can get Waterford yet, but whatever. You'll get it when you get it. Yeah, lovely. Very much... I, I get the cocoa thing. It's like chocolate milkshake. Like, uh, like actually, cocoa pops and milk. Cocoa pops. <laughs> when was the last time anyone here had cocoa pops? That was like the the cheat cereal, like the naughty cereal. That was the weekend cereal when you're a kid or something. Uh, you know, wheat picks for wheat picks for the week and cocoa pops on the weekend. I've got a call coming in. Why don't we take another call? Here we go. Hello, you're live. Who's speaking? Hey, Matt. It's Lachlan. Hey, mate. How you doing? Good. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Lachlan from Whiskey and Almond. Uh, how are we going? Yeah, good, good. I was just about to jump off to go have my dinner, but I wanted to just jump on and represent the partner bars of Australia. Absolutely. I um, didn't have any questions to ask, but I just wanted to say these Glen Scotias that are being bottled by the Scotsmore Whiskey Society represent exactly what I love about that distillery. Um, their haphazard approach to production for the last 20 years has just been so exciting for us, a single cast, trying all these incredible sample town malts that just have no distinct characteristics. It's just incredible. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. And it's they are... These 93s we get, I think, are some of the most criminally overlooked in some ways. Um, I entirely agree. It's it's literally up the road from where 27 sits, and 27 has a cult-like status, whereas some of the 93s you get are uh, crazy yeast bills, crazy distillations of actually really interesting spirit. And it, they're like the, 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 the underdog that could in some ways, and they're what they've turned around, especially in the last few years in terms of quality, uh, of output from even a core range and in a single cask format is believable. I know. It's it's just incredible. And even when I was at Loch Lomond eight months ago, talking to them about the changes they made to, to Glen Scotia as a distillery, I was pretty unhappy to see that they've made their production a lot more consistent to prevent these incredible, unique single casks that we have seen over the last you know, 10 years. So yeah. it's a shame that we'll see that go eventually. But um, I wanted to jump on and just say hey to everyone and we all appreciate the support from all of the society members as a partner bar and I'm sure everyone else does around the uh, around the country. Yeah, look, and, 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 and throw, everyone throw your support behind these partner bars that are doing it tough at the moment. Uh, they are doing, they're, they're doing sample packs, boiler maker packs, uh, and they're, they're, put, they're doing some great stuff just to keep it going until we're all able to return to some level of normalcy again. I want to do a huge shout out to Brooke, Jules, Lockie, Evan, Emma, Maddie, Austin, everyone on the team uh, who has been who has been a part of that journey. Um, and um, I hope to see you all got you guys back all on track, back on your feet soon. Yeah, uh, we we'd love to. I just cannot wait to get back behind that bar again. Um, do you even know how to, do you even know how to use a jigger anymore? 
Oh, no, not really. I've just been free pouring all my whiskey into whatever class I can find. Yeah. <laughs> like tonight, I, I decided to open up my bottle of Antec biscuits and cricket bats and just enjoying it as we have been watching through this. So, Yeah, right. Awesome bottling, and I'm, I'm glad you got stuck into that. Yeah, me too. All right, well, I'll leave you guys to it, and uh, enjoy the rest of your night. Thanks for the call, mate. Enjoy your dinner. Bye-bye. Cheers. Thanks, Lockie. Thanks. For, great call there. Um, great chat. Big shout out to him and um, and the whole team at Whiskey and Almond, as I said. And a whole shout, a big shout out to all of our partner bars. Uh, I'm not going to list them all individually right now, but um, you can check them all out on our website. Just go Society Partner Bars. Uh, well worth following them along. See what they're doing. Hmm. Ah, any comments I've missed out on here? I'm going to jump in. Um, Cocoa Pops was a week ago for you, Tim. <laughs> Good, good stuff. Um, was planning on going down to Whiskey uh next, next week, but cannot due to current reason. Uh, would have been my first time. Lockie, I know, mate. You've you've got to get down there next time. It's when, when you're able to. I think it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a rush. It's 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 something. It's a proper experience. It's a it's a fantastic bar. So many great partner bars in our network. Um, thanks for the tasting pack, Lock on WA. Absolutely, yes. WNA will endure. Yes, absolutely. They have to. Um, that's my that's my sort of discussion on 93.120. Um, I've tasted three whiskeys from Outturn just now. I hope you're all having a dram in hand as well. Uh, Anthony Cowie asks, Matt, are you seeing much coming through the society from the Highlands and Islands? Very good question, Cowie. Um, bits and bobs here and there at the moment. Uh, we do see a few Highland casks through every month or so. Um, islands, however, if you're referring to things like Aaron or... Talisco or whatnot, that not too many, not too many at the moment. Um, we see a bit of um, bit of Orkney here and there, a few fours come through. Uh, I haven't had a four dot something in a little while, but um, that might change soon. Uh, but yeah, we it, the diversity always goes up and down. That's the one thing that people often forget with society casks is that they there's a sort of a, a it's almost like a, a wave graph if you like. We all see a, a nice big glut, and then it might be well, sorry, other way around. We'll see you know a bit of a um, scarce times in some codes or, or some regions or some flavor profile, not so much flavor profiles. We always have different flavor profiles, but, uh, and then sometimes we'll see heaps of a certain code or then not much. And then heaps, and that might be over the scale of two years per turn kind of thing, or three years per turn. I, I remember when I uh, first joined the society working on the team, it was, we had almost every single month. I've, I've told this story before, so you're going to hear it again. Almost every month we had a three dot something. And so we had these, Old Isla whiskeys from Distillery Three, and uh, and it was sort of like uh, we had a complaint almost, uh, not a complaint, saying why is there so many old threes coming through? Why don't we get you know, it's too many, too many uh, old Bemores coming through? And it's like ah, sorry about that. <laughs> like if only if only we had them every month. Now it just doesn't exist anymore. So like that's it doesn't it's not just for us. It doesn't exist anywhere. <laughs> I knew I was going to knock a glass over. Getting it too expressive there. But it, these, it, it goes up and down, and that's why we see it in waves. We'll see some, some old, some new, some old, some new, all that kind of thing. And, that's, and that keeps it interesting. It means that we'll sometimes see a lot of old stock. We'll sometimes see some young stock. We'll see island stock, isla stock, highland stock, space stock. So we don't, I don't really talk regions too much for good because I don't think we need to talk regions. I think regions are a fairly redundant marketing tool of, of where whiskey comes from. If you have a peated whiskey from the Highlands, does that mean it's now, is that still a Highland whiskey in profile? Pardon me. Like a 66? Pardon me. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, we haven't seen any HP for a little while. We haven't seen any fours for a little while. But that's what, that's what I'm saying, Carrie. They go, they sort of go in, they go in waves and we'll sometimes see quite a few in a, in a row. Then we won't see any in a little while. Actually, I've got a bottle of four dot something, uh, four dot two one zero or two one two zero one, sitting on my uh, cabinet, um, waiting to be opened in during these isolating times. Because I found it, it's I've had it in my collection for years, and I thought, well, I don't I think I, I don't think I've got many fours, if any. So I want to open that one, and I might do that might do that shortly. Um, yeah, that was only last year, Nick Huzek. Very good point. Orkney Beekeeper's Dram, that was a four. And Mermaid's Marmalade last year. If, Nick, you got a Mermaid's Marmalade. Amazing cask. That was a 13 or 14-year-old sherried four. 
And I missed out on that because in for egalitarian keeping it fair for members, I make sure members have first dibs on anything we release. And I don't I don't buy one for myself or anything, and neither do any of the staff, Andrew, Susie, no one. Uh, because we want to make sure members get first dibs on these things before uh, we have a crack at them. So I thought to myself, if there's any left after outturn day, maybe I'll grab one then, but no such luck. Sherried, Sherried Highland Park uh, single casks, you know, there you go. Uh, yeah, we've seen lots of 10s. That's right, good point, uh, Zeno. Lots of 10s in the last year. So the last 12 months, we've had a lot a big string of 10s, and I guarantee you, maybe, I can't guarantee you, but, you know, maybe... Like, in a year's time, there won't be any 10s. And people will say, oh, where's all the 10s? It's all about ex enjoying the, the, the cycle of things because things change. And if we're not seeing a lot of 10s, we might see a lot of something else. And, you know, it's like, that's exactly right. Uh, now that 18th Amendment Bar in Geelong have bought into the Lost Ones Bar, which is the partner bar in Ballarat, correct? Does this mean the 18th Amendment will come onto the partner bar too? Lee, we're working on it. That's a very, a, a very specific question, but I appreciate you asking because I know you're close to that side of town. So uh, the Lost Ones no longer exists as the Lost Ones. It's it's 18th Amendment Ballarat. So, uh, but they're not. I don't think either of them are open at the moment, of course. But we're working on them becoming partner bars once bars can reopen. Tim asks, why don't we see many bars now? Oh, the uh, long answer to that and a short answer. Short answer for now is that they don't sell any spirit at the moment. They they just don't. They don't sell to anyone. They keep it all themselves. They treat it as a luxury. Um, uh, single malt. That's why they are very interested in the high end on their core range bottlings for thirty thousand dollars. In the bottom end for eye candy and to raise attention of the high end stuff and travel retail. They're just not selling. They're not selling spirit. And we've got some threes maturing, uh, which will be bottled soon. But we don't have any. Um, no. Well, they'll be bottled when they're ready. Sorry, not soon. I don't know when they're being bottled. Um, but yeah, we, yeah, we see we, they come in and out. You'll see some threes, see some, not see some. That's the way it goes. Um, should be bow less now. <laughs> bow more, bow less. <laughs> We'd love to see a brook lady back in out tonight. Oh, me too, Joey. Don't worry. Um, my 4.232 is almost gone. Ah, there you go. Okay. Down to a good dreg. Um, <laughs> Tristan says, I made an error and started watching without a dram ready. I'm triggered. Need to go and get a uh, and pour some uh, island malt back soon. Good stuff. Good stuff. Oh, you, you just poured seventy six dot one one two spice uh, champurado. I don't remember that cask, Tim. Um, but it sounds tasty. I do love the seventy sixes. They're also those big meaty casks. They're fantastic. Um, both less is more. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, mermaid's marmalade. Well, yeah, the team refill sherry, but thirteen year old. Lovely cask. I. I got a dram of it at Whisk and Helmet when I was down and I um uh, uh, months ago and I remember going, damn, I should have got one of those. Anyway, Jane Everham joined. Uh, thank you so much. Um, James Turton asks, my 128.6 stock is running very low. Need another release from the distillery. Uh, lucky for you, James, there's one coming through. So not this outturn or the next, but maybe uh, June, July, I'm not sure. That's up to that's Andrew's call, but there's, there's one coming through, which is very exciting. Ah, Cool. I've been talking non-stop pretty much for an hour and 20 minutes. Thank you so much, everyone. To finish with, however, because I've had three drams and I've talked about, it, about all three, uh, to finish with, I'm going to give you, again, some of my top tips for outturn tomorrow. Boom, there it is. Midday tomorrow is outturn. Uh, my top tips for navigating outturn, as I've said before, you can filter by price on the website. We've got a little price scale filter. That means if there's one bottling you're after in particular that you're worried is going to sell out, you can set the price filter just to show that bottling pretty much. So let's say you want that G4.19. It's $5.99. Search for bottles that are priced between $5.98 and $600. There it is. So when you refresh the shop page, it's there ready for you. Second tip is if you uh, check out, if you want, there's a bottling you want to make sure you get and you don't want to miss out on, check out first with that. Pay the $15 freight on it and then it, uh, come back and get whatever else you're after. Yes, you'll double pay freight, but $15 of that will be refunded back to you. Susie will look after that. So that's not a problem. It gets refunded back almost straight away. So um, if there's something you're after, get through the checkout first. Don't put something in your cart and then think, oh, I'm going to have a look through the other bottlings, read some of the tasting notes. The time to read tasting notes and read up on what's coming is already in your hand, either digitally or physically like this. 
So that's the, that's the second tip to give you. And the third one is, uh, yes, I was, I've already talked about the cart, yes, but really is just, um, um, what would be the third tip? Yeah, oh, this the third tip is probably the most important one that I still see some people getting wrong. Make sure you're logged in. I see sometimes people browsing. I think, oh, I can't get that one. It's selling out quick. They, they they go add to cart. Oh, won't let me add to cart. Why not? I'm not. Oh, I'm not signed in. If you're a member of the society, sign in. That gives you access to all the bottlings, and you tick the box to stay signed in, or however it works on your browser as well. I recommend Chrome for that. Chrome's great, um, and that that will make sure it's um you get what you're after rather than having to sign in during outturn. Because sometimes, as you know, the site does get a bit crowded. Uh, James says, "My I've started watching Mad Men from the start again, and I have to have a glass of Essen of your whiskey in my hand whilst watching." Yeah, Mad Men has that effect on people. Um, it's I can't watch Mad Men without having a dram in hand either. It's it's sort of a and I don't smoke, but I, you know, I get that feeling like, oh yeah, I could definitely have a smoke and a drink right now. Now that <laughs> the effect of that show, it's one of my all-time favorite TV shows, by the way. Mad Men, fantastic show, up there with um the UK Peep Show. Uh, Mitchell and Webb's Peep Show. Um, yeah, no, fantastic, fantastic. Uh, yeah, be signed in. That's right, Zeno. Um, it was hard to watch that show without either a whiskey or an old-fashioned for me. Yeah, a nice big old-fashioned, a big cocktail. Um, you know what goes well in, a co- in an old-fashioned? Does anyone, does anyone here like rum old-fashions at all? R11.6, just add sunshine. That might go really nicely. That one's sold out, sorry. I'm just saying I've got a bit left in that bottle, so I was like... That might go nicely in a um, in a in a in a cocktail there. Uh, the wire, I need a drink with that too. Love the wire. I'm really hoping that the wire can be put on one of the streaming services soon because I've still got a, a wire DVD box set that I've lent to a friend, um, and I don't need it back in a hurry. But I was like, oh, I feel like watching the wire sometime. Great show, great show, especially the first two seasons. Uh, I liked seasons three, four, and five, but I think the first two seasons were the were the king on that. Um. I've been watching Ozark as well on Netflix. Ozark's great. All right. There are my top three tips for outturn. Those are from three whiskeys. Twas the night before outturn. Thank you everyone for joining in for an hour and a half chat of just some good good dram times. I'm going to call it there. I really appreciate you, everyone tuning in, being a part of tonight uh, and, and um, asking some amazing questions and taking your calls. I'm going to kill off the phone line now. So no more calls coming um, but uh, I really appreciate uh, everything tonight and I'll see you all tomorrow, out turn, midday, AD, ADT, Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. Uh, I'll see you, it's out turns at midday, of course. It is every first Friday of every month and I'm looking forward to it, of course. Grab yourself a bottle of Big Swell at the very least, throw that in the cart, always good fun. Uh, I'll do it and of course I'll be live at eight o'clock tomorrow night. I'm live every night and I'll see you live tomorrow. Um, and I really appreciate all of your questions and being a part of this. Thank you everyone for all the great questions as I said before. Tristan, Lee, Stuart, Scott, Georgia, Nick, Johnny, everyone really appreciate it. If you haven't watched the stream with Johnny Edwards, catch up on that on our YouTube page. Just search SMWS Australia. Please subscribe. We've got a hundred and something subscribers now. doesn't sound like a lot, but it means a lot to me because I get to, talk, get to talk about great whiskey and take your questions. It's always very informal, always a lot of fun. I'll see you all um, uh, tomorrow. Thanks.